Chandler Community Fellowship family and friends. I'm Pastor Lisa Savino, and I'm so glad that you've decided to worship with us this morning. Let's open up with a word of prayer, and let's get right into today's message. Will you bow your head with me, please? Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you so much, Lord, for life, for health, for strength. We Thank you for the opportunity and the privilege of prayer, and we just ask that you will be with us throughout our worship service, that you will help us to focus, to concentrate, to take in all that you have for us, and to walk away from this service forever changed. These and all things we humbly ask, believe, and claim in the worthy name of Jesus, and it is so. Amen. I somehow and all my rushing around have forgotten to put my microphone on. So let's continue. I pray that you all have had a wonderful week and um, that you are just living in the Lord's blessings. I know that sometimes we still go through things, but no matter what we go through, we always still have something to be grateful for. So today's scripture comes from the book of Ezra chapter 3 verses 10 and 11. That's the book of Ezra chapter 3 verses 10 and 11. Let me know if you all can hear me okay as well. If you if you could please let me know if you can can hear me okay. So um, the scripture reads, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments, that means they're, they're in their robes, with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good. His love to Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Family, this was an exciting time for the people of God. Prophecies were fulfilled, strongholds were broken, judgment was executed, and the captives literally were set free. You know, um, in the book of Isaiah, in um, chapter 44, verse 28, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. Now, family, if you know anything about what was going on back then, you know that, you know, despite this being an exciting time now, it was not all fun and games before. This was the time when the Children of Israel had been taken captive. They had been in exile for about 70 years. And, you know, it, as the kids say, it was, it was all bad. And after the 70 years of exile, you know, the Lord had already prophesied before he had pronounced judgment on them what would happen. And to let them know that, you know, you were wrong. You need to be punished for this, but I still love you. God told them that a deliverer would come and that they will be able to go back to their homeland. And so that was King Cyrus. You know, King Cyrus, who was the founder of the Persian Empire, he, God chose him to conquer Babylon and appointed him to rebuild the temple at Jerusalem. The, the scripture that I just read for you in the book of Isaiah in um, chapter 44, verse 28, it talked about Cyrus. Now, mind you, I need you to know that when that scripture was written, Cyrus was not even born. That was in 688 BC. That prophecy was fulfilled in 538 BC. So you see about 150 years before any of this happened, God had already spoken judgment, had already ensured their deliverance, had already talked about who was going to be in place. So they were clear. Yeah, you're going to go through this, but Cyrus, God was going to appoint as king of Persia. 
I love how second Chronicles went even a little deeper in second Chronicles verse uh, chapter 36 verses 22 and 23. I'm getting a little excited about this in the first year of King of Cyrus, King of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, King of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, King of Persia says. The Lord the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up and may the Lord God be with them. So as prophecy, you know, stated, you know, Cyrus wrote the written proclamation, gave permission to all who were of the Jewish remnant to, told them they could return home and help build the temple. 50,000 captives from Judah were allowed to go home and to rebuild. I love how just the act of Cyrus being anoint, anoint, appointed an anointed king, Cyrus um, conquering the Babylons, Cyrus you know, even being able to read as some scholars said what the Lord said, and he was so moved. He followed the Lord's prompting. Amen. So with the, um, with King Cyrus being in charge with the children of Israel, allowing, you know, being allowed to go back home to rebuild the temple, a number of prophecies were fulfilled in Isaiah chapter 48. You know how how the the prophet mentioned the um, that the the temple was going to be built, the foundation was going to be laid. That Cyrus was his shepherd and shall perform all his pleasure. That wasn't the only one. Jeremiah chapter twenty five verse twelve. Babylon was punished for destroying Jerusalem and exiling God's people. Jeremiah 29 and 10, God's people would be exiled for 70 years and brought back home. Another prophecy, Daniel, Daniel 5, 17 through 30, God would judge the Babylonians and give them to the Medes and the Persians forming a new world power. You see, when God pronounced judgment, he had already been warning his children, just warning them, warning them, warning them, and they did not listen. So by the time all of this had taken place, like I said, prophecies had been fulfilled. Um, you know, strongholds had been broken. Judgment was executed and the, and the captives, the captives family were literally set free. You can understand now why it was an exciting time for the people of God. And this scripture meant so much more to them, so much more to them. I think I'm going to read it again. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments, that's in their robes, and with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and with thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good, His love to Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. The Lord's covenant with them was being reestablished. Amen. Amen. And that is the perfect backdrop for me to share with you the title of today's sermon, Rebuilding the Temple. You know, in order to rebuild anything, be it a house, a temple or anything, there has got to be, you know, there's got to be planning. There's got to be a pre-construction plan. So before the temple is rebuilt, a few things must happen. You know, you've got to acknowledge the need. Well, it was not just acknowledging the need, but this was fulfilling what the Lord had already pronounced as far as part of the judgment and what he utilized the prophets to prophesy. 
So the, the need of the temple was already there. It was necessary. It was prophesied. You've got to raise capital. Well, the Lord, if he said the temple was going to be built, he had already provided what was needed for it to be rebuilt. Amen. You have to select an area to build or rebuild. Well, he was taking them back home, reclaiming that spot, that place, that land where the temple that was previously built and destroyed by the Babylonians for it to be rebuilt. And finally, you've got to clear the land once you claim it. So you got to clear it of all the waste and all the debris that was there. Because remember, it had been torn. It, it had not only been destroyed by fire, they had just wrecked that place. And so all those things had to be cleared up. And so in order to rebuild the temple, the temple had to have a foundation, but not just any foundation family. It has to be a sure foundation. Now, when you talk about building the physical foundation of any structure, a house, a, a, a building or anything, you have three main foundation systems that you can choose from. Now, the foundations, when I did my research, you have three foundations that are commonly used nowadays to build any kind of structure. You have slabs, you have basements, and you have crawl spaces. I'll say that again. You have slabs, you have basements, and you have crawl spaces. Now, the slab is probably the easiest foundation to build and the most economical. It's a flat concrete pad poured directly on the ground. It takes very little preparation, very little form work for the concrete and very little labor to create. It works well on level sites and in warm climates, but it has problems like places up north where there's cold climates because the ground freezes in the winter. And so this freezing can cause a shift on the slab at worst, and at the least, it could lead to cold floors. Now, the second foundation to choose from is called a crawl space. Now, crawl spaces have a few advantages over slabs and over basements that we'll talk about in a minute. It gets the house up off the ground, you know, especially in a damp or termite prone area. It's a lot less expensive than a basement and comparable in price to a slab. Now, ductwork and plumbing can run in the crawl space, making them easy to service and move over the lifetime of the house. Now, here it comes. One problem that arises in crawl spaces is dampness. Dampness can weaken the foundation. In order to keep the water out in this particular foundation, the crawl space, you must dig a trench around the crawl space to route the water away. So, you know, if it rained, if there's a storm, you know, it'll just weaken the foundation, but you've got to build that, that um, trench to redirect the water around the, the structure so that it won't weaken the foundation. Now, the basement. The basement is the most expensive foundation of all. Homes or buildings with basement foundations are built using a concrete perimeter of pillars uh, that support the building's above ground structure. So not only do they have that concrete um, foundation, kind of like the, um, the slab, but it is built after digging about eight feet deep in the ground. You, and, and with that, you've got to clear, you got to do some excavation. You got to clear all the dirt and debris out and whatever was under there, you get, you have to pull that out because you have got to make sure that this foundation is sure. And so after you dig eight feet deep, you clear all the debris out and then you lay that, that concrete slab. After you do that, a concrete perimeter of pillars that will not only support and surround the foundation, but it will support the buildings above ground structure. 
You see, these foundations, like I said, are, min are minimally dug at about a depth of eight feet. And that's above the home's footing. But the greatest family, the greatest benefit of a home or building with a basement foundation is obviously the added square footage, uh, and, you know, the additional space and the opportunity for future renovations. So, you know, we've talked about the temple or, or uh, you know, building as a um, structure, as a physical building, a physical house, a physical structure. Now what I want to talk about is our body temple in that same regard. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So with that being said, we all acknowledge, if we're honest with ourselves, that we all could use a little work on our temples because I don't know about you, but my foundation has not always been solid. In our spiritual pre-construction phase, we can in one step acknowledge the need for repair or, re or replacement, raise capital, select the area to build and clear the land because in our spiritual reconstruction phase, we already know that we need some work. We, we talk about the, the capital that needs to be raised, much like the temple that was going to be built, rebuilt by the children of Israel. God already told them that there, it was going to be rebuilt. He sent his, his, his men to prophesy of what was needed and what was going to happen. And so we all, if we want to have a sure foundation like the children of Israel, we have that same promise of if we need this temple to be rebuilt, we need this foundational structure to be in place, a sure foundation. We have the promise of God because here's the thing. God knows that we need God knows exactly what we need. And if he knows what we need, don't you know that he is going to supply our needs, especially when that foundation is directly tied to him. We need that foundation to be called the children of God in order to house the spirit of God in us. So acknowledging the need of repair, acknowledging the need for God, knowing that this, this is the area that needs to be rebuilt and to be able to clear that land, we need God's help and God is going to supply all of our needs. So in that spiritual um, construction phase, like any, any building, in order to rebuild, we've got to have that foundation. Like we said, that sure foundation, but we have to decide what foundation we are going to rebuild this temple on. Now, just like building a, a regular, a regular building, a, a regular structure, we've got three foundational systems to choose from the slabs, the basements and the crawl spaces. Now, in the spirit, the slab foundation appears solid. You know, it, it, it looks like it's okay. It has a form of godliness. You know, you may start going to church. You may dress a little differently. You may talk and act a little differently. But underneath that concrete slab family, nothing, absolutely nothing has changed. Matthew 5, 15 and 8 says, these people draw nigh to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me because underneath that concrete slab are the same people, places, and things that were a part of your life that still remain. Nothing has changed. It just looks better. It looks like things have changed. Now let's go to the crawl space. Now the crawl space, the crawl space family is a little different. That crawl space foundation gets you up off the ground. This is a 
feel good kind of foundation. It excites you. But family, you remain hollow inside. The dampness of those old habits still have easy access to your temple and weakens your foundation. So, you know, you have to dig a trench to route the water away, but rest assured it will return because family, your foundation is not sure. And if it rains enough, if that damp water still remains, you know that you are still in trouble and it still can weaken your foundation. I like how 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 5 and 7 says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. So this one, you know, it's a little deeper than the, the concrete slab, you know, you know, you, it, you, some of your actions, you know, you may read a little more, you may do a little more and on the outside, you know, not only does it look different, but they see you going to church. They, they see you doing some other things. They may see you even doing some ministry, but it's still not a sure foundation. It is still subject to the rains and the storms of life. So let's go to the basement. Now, family, the basement is the most expensive foundation of all. In the basement foundation, this requires more than the others. This foundation requires spiritual excavation. And if you've ever seen um, the excavation process, there's this big machine, you know, this, it, it looks like this big, um, this, this big uh, machine that digs in the ground and, and it, I mean, it pulls up everything. It digs, it digs, it goes far beneath the circus surface. It cuts through those habits and those behaviors that you can see and exposes those things that you couldn't. You see, this foundation clears it all out. It pulls everything out. Then after it clears everything out, it prepares the ground, that, that eight foot deep hole to be poured with that concrete slab. And see, once it's all cleared out completely, that leak proof concrete foundation, which is the word of God, you know, it all has to be built there. But, you know, it's like Jesus instructed his followers to make sure that they not only heard his words, but also put those words into practice. You see, if they did that, then they would be like a wise man that had laid his foundation on a rock. I love how Matthew 7, 24 and 25 tells us, you know, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because it's the foundation it had was on the rock. You remember those concrete pillars, that concrete perimeter of pillars that we talked about in the basement foundation? Well, that's the Holy Spirit that surrounds and supports the temples, not only the temple's foundation, it supports its above ground structure. Remember, the greatest benefit of the basement foundation is obviously the square footage, you know, the added square footage, that additional space. But I think, the greatest opportunity that it provides is for future renovations. Family, from the very beginning, this foundation was built with growth in mind. You see, family, the, the necessity of having a firm foundation is a lesson that we all need to learn especially when it comes to our spiritual lives, our spiritual house. The building's structural integrity is dependent upon the types of materials that are used and the type of foundation it's built on. If you use substandard 
materials as your foundation, your foundation is going to be compromised from the very start. In the same way, we need to be very careful what we building are building our spiritual house, our spiritual work on. And we need to take heed how we're building. Family, you know, like in the story that we were sharing earlier about the children of Israel when they came out of exile, before they went into there, God had been warning them and warning them over and over again to repent. But ignoring God's warnings will bring destruction. In their case, exile. But even in the midst of discipline, family, there was love. You know, the word says God chastens whom he loves. And you know, the root word of, of you know, dis, of disciple is, is discipline. You know, what the Lord does not prevent, he allows for a reason. God uses, God used the enemy in that case who was evil anyway, the Babylonians, to discipline his disobedient children. But he also guaranteed his children's deliverance. To assure them of their deliverance, God even names the person by whom he would use to deliver them. He told them it would be Cyrus. And that, that name was mentioned and by God's prophets, at least about 11 times that I saw as I was preparing for the sermon. And this was long before Cyrus was born. His name was mentioned almost like 150, 200 years before any of this took place. Long before he was born, Cyrus' destiny was already foretold. And even when Cyrus read the, the, the word of the Lord, he was so moved that he knew he had to be obedient to God. He was so moved by God's words. God, even after he used the enemy to punish his disobedient children, he punished the enemy for messing with his children. Why? Because they were evil anyway. This was in their heart to do. This is what they did. And so God used them to do what they were already going to do to punish the children that he told where he was going to punish them. But it wasn't to utterly destroy them. It was to get their attention because no sin goes unpunished. He chastens whom he loves. Sometimes in order to get put back on the right track, we need to feel the weight of the destruction that we've caused. We need to feel the weight of the things that we've done. We are not allowed the luxury of not feeling the, 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 the full brunt of what situation we ourselves in our own disobedience have brought into existence. We don't have that luxury to not face what we have created, family. But I'm sure all of that sounds a little familiar. You know, paying attention to God's warning will save us from destruction. One of our responsibilities of being a Christian, being Christ-like, being a child of God is warning all people of God's coming judgment, warning all people and letting them know that the way of deliverance is provided through Jesus. We must first understand that ourselves so that we can truly be a witness for God. And so family, I want to ask you something because I've already asked myself, what kind of, day, what kind of foundation is your body temple resting on? Is it resting on a slab? Is it resting on a crawl space? Or is it resting on a basement? Whatever foundation system your temple is resting on, 
Family, if it's your desire to refurbish your temple structure, be it a, a minor repair and maintenance or major demolition and, and restoration, rebuilding that temple, I recommend, family, I recommend with all that's in me that you talk to Jesus, our master builder. Tell him that your temple needs fixing. It's like the, the old song, oh, fix me, oh, fix me, oh, fix me, fix me, Jesus, fix me. Ask him to fix you for your home on high. Ask Jesus to fix you for the by and by. Ask him to fix him for your starry crown. Ask him to fix you for your long white robe. Ask him with everything in you as you raise your hands, fix me, Jesus, fix me, fix me, Jesus, fix me. If you ask God to fix you, if you raise your hand in submission, asking, pleading, begging him to do what he truly wants to do anyway, because it is not his desire that any of us should perish. I promise you, if you do that, family, if you do that, I promise you it will be the best decision that you'll ever make. You know how we talked about earlier in the structures, how the storms may come, but the foundation was sure, the structure was sure. You may, you may face some storms, that's part of the journey, being a follower of Christ. You're going to face some storms, but your foundation, your structure, no matter what happens, will remain sure. If on Christ the solid rock we stand, family, all other ground is sinking sand. That foundation, standing on the foundation of our Lord, and Savior, Jesus Christ, ensures our safety, ensures that we will be standing. When all else fails, we will remain standing. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. So family, if you have lifted your hand, and ask our Lord and Savior, fix me, Jesus, fix me. Trust and believe. Your renovation process has already begun. It is his will, his desire, that we all have that firm foundation, which is Christ Jesus. It is his desire his foundation. That alone made sure that your will is in alignment with his will. So family, I invite you, if that was your desire, please pray with me because you know the renovation process is not done overnight. It's done over time. And so the reconstruction process has begun. Let us pray so that even as we go through that process, the Lord will keep us focused on him despite what we see because in that reconstruction process we're going to see some things that 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 aren't going to be so pleasant some things that might downright scare us some things that might discourage us but we have to keep our eyes on Jesus amen amen let's bow our heads in prayer father god in the name of Jesus i thank you so much for being that firm foundation. I thank you so much, Lord, for giving us all that we need. I thank you so much, Lord, for loving us as unstable, unsteady, and unsure as we are, Lord. I thank you for loving us when we're not so lovable. I thank you for loving us through our disobedience, Lord. I thank you through loving us through all the things that we've done and said to ourselves and each other and ways that we've disappointed you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for loving us through all of that, Lord. Loving us through all of that, Lord, gave us the foundation 
of a, of a witness and a testimony so that Lord, when we go all out into the world preaching and teaching for a witness, Lord, that we can share that how unstable, how, how unworthy, how, how unsteady our foundation was so that even with our lives, when we were disobedient, we can show how you love through us. So even as we share our testimonies and bear witness, Lord, to your love, as we share our testimonies to others who like us, Lord, have a weak and unsteady foundation, they will know that they can find, they can find hope and trust in you, Lord. They will know that they can truly rebuild their lives on you, Lord. They can truly say like us, Lord, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for being our firm foundation. We thank you, Lord, for, for surrounding us and giving us a comforter that is the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for being the living word, Lord. We thank you for being who you are, who you say you are, Lord. We thank you for being a man, not like man, that you should lie, Lord. You are incapable of lying, Lord. We thank you for all that you've given us in the past, what you're doing right now. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the renovation of our temple, Lord, in the future with that firm foundation. We thank you so much, Lord. We love you. And Lord, we continue to lift those, Lord, who may be in the valley of decision. We continue to lift you up and thank you for those who've made the decision. And we continue to lift you up and lift up holy hands, Lord, on behalf of those who are yet to make that decision. We claim them, Lord, and we pray that you will prepare us to be able to receive them, to teach them, to ask them to follow us, even as we follow Christ. These and all things we humbly ask, believe, and claim in the worthy name of Jesus, and it is so. Amen. Family, we pray that you were blessed by today's message. We ask that if you if it's your desire to just connect with us, allow us to be your family. We want to be your brothers and sisters, and we want you to be a part of us. We pray that you will reach out to us on any of our social media platforms, that you will connect with us. Let us pray with you. Let us pray with you. Let us learn and grow and connect. Let us do it all together. I thank you so much for sharing this time with us here at Community Fellowship. We thank you so much for sharing a portion of your Sabbath with us. I wanna thank those of us who've joined. I see my sister Val is on here. I thank you so much. My sister from Detroit, I thank you so much for joining us today. And I just wanna thank you all. And I also want to thank in advance those who may later view this video. I pray that you all will be touched by the word that God used today. Thank you so much. Have a blessed and happy Sabbath family. And as we close in benediction, as always, our benediction is found in the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. That's the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verses 24 and 26. And it simply says, May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. I love you all with the love of the Lord. And until the next time that the Lord brings us back together again, be blessed, have a blessed and prosperous week. And I look, look forward to seeing you again next Sabbath.